to represent him to the world. He plans for you as a citizen of the kingdom of God to take that kingdom uh, culture to wherever you are, your workplace or wherever you are and so forth and so on. Now, the idea about living in the kingdom is, now this is important, it, it's being ruled by uh, the word of God uh, in our hearts instead of being ruled uh, by something being enforced by an external system. Because we are internally ruled, um, Christ in you, it's that God really works with us so that we can properly represent him and keep us in a world that perhaps is against us. This is a world that perhaps doesn't understand you or, or whatever have you. But this, he is now giving us the privilege of going into the world and representing him. We, we call that ambassadorship. So you and I are ambassadors. Say, I am an ambassador. Now, he for sure knows that you're going into a place where he says you'll go like lambs among wolves. That there'll be some people in there and some devices and some traps set up and so forth. But God's got your back. As we talked about last time, we talked about this anointing. And what is the anointing? And we talked about it in terms of its ability. It is God's burden removing, yoke destroying power. We found that out in the prophetic word that was giving about, given about the coming of Christ in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. He talked about, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now the anointing is the most powerful force in the universe. Now, when you think of rust, rust, I'm talking about you leave something out in the weather and it gets rusty. All right, sometimes the parts can get rusty and they can get so rusty until they start to corrode and even start to disintegrate. Now when, when that happens, now they're not fit to be used. And, and you, if you're going to build them back again, you're going to have to put new parts in there because that rust is so um, damaging until you can't put that rust back. It's done. It oxidizes. It's, some of the parts rust so bad till you wonder what happened to the part. Um, that's a picture of the anointing. It says over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, he said, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, let's look at that same uh, verse in the Amplified Translation. He said, but he who commits sin, who practices evil doings, is of the devil, takes his character from the evil one. For the devil has sinned violated the divine law from the beginning. The reason the son of God was manifested visible was to undo, destroy, loosen, and dissolve the works the devil has done. See, dissolve means he can make it uh, such that it can't come back on you. See, if he releases you from sickness, that can't come back. He has dissolved it, see. And this is what Jesus did. But notice it says his purpose. See, he, had, he knew his purpose for being here. And he was empowered to do what his purpose was to be done here in this earth. Um, if you look at Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 4 and start at verse uh, 17. And there was delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah, so Isaiah, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. 
that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it again to the minister, and he sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So notice, he now knew what his purpose was, found himself in the book. And then he began to proclaim that this was the one that this book was written about, that I'm here now and I'm anointed to preach. See, you just can't get up and preach. You got to be anointed to preach. Now, notice you just can't do whatever you do. Whatever you do, what company you work with, whatever you do, you were not meant to work without that anointing. Because that anointing was going to do something to distinguish you and make it so that you become a witness to people who are around you that they want to know what you got. You tell them what's in me can be in you. All you have to do is join the kingdom. Praise God. Now, this, uh, what's in you, you didn't choose you, but God chose you. Now, he said so over in John chapter 15, verse 16, but you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you go forth and bring forth what? Fruit. See, you're to produce something here in this world. He said in Ephesians and chapter one, verses three and four, he says this, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all, what kind of blessings? Spiritual blessings where? In heavenly places where? In Christ. Now Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. All right. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now I know you're in here today, but when were you chosen? Before the foundation of the world. When do you think God made provision for you? For the foundation of the world. Before was created on the sixth day in the earth, did God not make the trees, make the lands, make the waterways, make the animals, everything man would need as provision God made before man got here. And everything you would need in your life, God made before he even chose you. He didn't choose you three years ago. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Can you say amen to that? Now, in choosing you, the tendency is to think that you got to be somebody special. Now, here's a thing that I caught one time. That when God chose you, he didn't choose you because of who you are. He chose you because who you were to become. Say amen. Because when he chose you, you might have been in jail. When he chose you, you might have been out there 
uh, um, uh, smoking reefer. He chose you. You might now. I can go through a lot of things, but I want you to know that he chose you. He knew that you were going to come through a situation or through a sinner, through an incarceration. Come on, married five times. He knew that, but he chose you anyway. And the thing about God, he won't go back on his choice. You see, his true his choosing is forever. He he is <laughs> his gifts and his callings are without repentance. He won't draw them back. Say amen to that. Now, you know, I was just kind of looking up uh, some of these people that he chose, and I was just seeing that he was choosing people like. Esther, for example, and over in Esther chapter two, over in Esther chapter two, it even talks and describes, and he brought up Hadassah. That is Esther. That was her name in the Jewish and his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. And the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Now this was what I would call an orphan. I'm saying he chose this woman who was an orphan, who in fact was used to save an entire race. Am I right about it? Look how he chose Moses. Go over to Exodus and Moses said this to the Lord. Oh my Lord. I'm not eloquent, neither hitherfore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech. In other words, I, c- 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 I, I, c- I can't talk. God said, wait a minute, who made your mouth? I'm just saying, what's your excuse for what God wants you to do? And many times we try to back up on God, but who God calls, who he ordains and he empowers you to do whatever he's called you to do. Say amen to that. Look at Gideon. Gideon admitted that he was the stupidest one in the tribe. Look at the woman who was at the well in John chapter four. And here she was. She wanted to draw some water. Well, the disciples were there and Jesus said, now I don't want these disciples to ruin this thing. He said, I'm going to send them over and get some food. Why don't y'all go in the city and get some food for me? I'll, I'll just stay by the well. They went and got the food. Here comes a woman at the well. He comes to draw water. Jesus said, why don't you give me to drink? Well, he was a Jew. She was Samaritan and she said well no it isn't now the Jews are not really caught drinking water at the same place with a Samaritan you know a low person like I am Jesus said well if you knew who was talking to you you'd ask him and he'd give you some living water praise God so what happened was she messed around kept talking to him and all of a sudden he started to be revealed and she said this you must be a prophet And he he said, okay, go call your husband and come here. She said, well, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. You don't have a husband and and you've been married five times and the one you shacking up with right now, he ain't your husband. She said, you must be a prophet. Well, what happened? He then revealed himself to her. She then went into the city, witnessed to a bunch of men. And they all came out to see him. Now, what did he do? He took a woman who had been married five times and made a powerful evangelist out of her. I'm telling you, you didn't choose him. He chose you. Not because of what you are, but what you can become. So I'm saying for you right now, why don't you get used to the fact that God chooses foolish things. First Corinthians chapter one and verse 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh or not many mighty or not many noble are called. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, the things which are not, why? To bring to naught things that are, are, but that no flesh can, what? Glory in his presence. He does not want you to get one ounce of credit for what he does. Say amen into that. So I'm saying to you, as I look over this audience, I don't know what you might be using as an excuse for not following the leading of the Lord in doing certain things. But right now, let me tell you, all your excuses are going away. Say amen to that. God is a God who is going to be your help. Now over in Zechariah chapter four, he talks about the fact that he is the one that makes it happen. The anointing is the thing that makes it happen. Zechariah chapter four, starting at verse six. Then he answered and spake unto me saying, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. What he's saying is not by human effort or not by army, but God is gonna give it to you by his strength. Say amen. amen. Now with that, it takes a load off of you and me. And that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that we're not trying to get the credit for ourselves because we don't need the credit. Give God all the credit. Now in Genesis chapter 12, look at that in verse one. Now the Lord has said to Abram, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show you. And I'll make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless you and make your name great and you'll be a blessing. Now let's stop right there. Let's do that in the Amplified. Just see if we get another degree. clarity and I'll make of you a great nation. I will bless you with abundant increase of favors. Say favor. favor and make your name famous and distinguished. Say famous and distinguished Amen. and you will be a what? Blessing. You will be a blessing. Now God plans for you to be famous. Amen. He plans for you to be distinguished. So somewhere down the line, you should be famous for what you do. No, I didn't get many amens on that. Now God knows that he's placing you in a world and God deliberately places the righteous among the wicked. Now don't be timid, or afraid because he says over in Psalm chapter 105, he says this about you. Touch not my what? Anointed and do my prophets no harm. So God is not going to let them touch you. That you will be there, but you are in a season of the latter rain. You're in a season where the book that Jesus closed has just been reopened. And now God is about to use you to bring kingdom culture to a world that was in darkness. Now the enemy knows what you're loaded with. 
you are loaded with Christ. The most powerful force in the universe. That's what you're loaded with. Now, this is the same power that resting on Jesus, but Jesus had a little bit different mission than you have. True enough, you were to take the kingdom to the world. But your, his was limited in what he was to do. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing what? All that were oppressed of the devil. That was the limit of his. Now, just, I'm going to do this real quick. But just look at what happened in Acts chapter 13 when this man who was a sorcerer tried to keep Paul from witnessing to a government official. Acts chapter 13 and verse 6, please. And when they had gone through the aisle into Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the county or country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so he was named by interpretation, withstood them, resisted them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, fell with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on them. See, they, they put it in there because so, they don't want you to think he did that out of the flesh. This is the ministry of the Holy Ghost. And he put his eyes on him and said, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, you child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. Now he's speaking by the Spirit. And thou shalt be blind. Now wait a minute. I thought Jesus went about healing all that will oppress of the devil. Whoa, something happened here. Why? Because he did, Jesus did his part and closed the book. But now the book has been opened by the Holy Ghost. And there's another part to execute vengeance upon all the people of the enemies of God. And I'm telling you now, if anybody's standing in your way, there's a new sheriff in town. And I'm telling you, it's a new day. So he said, and now behold, the hand of the Lord's with thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. Glory to God. And he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. I'm telling you, you're going to be much, you're going to be much too much for witchcraft to deal with. I'm saying, if they try to curse you, look what's going to happen to them. Look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. This is what's going to happen to them if they try to curse you. He said this, I will bless them that bless you. Come on, come on, read it. I'm not saying you're going around cursing people, but I'm telling you, don't nobody get in your way now because we're turning the corner. We're getting into a new chapter of the book. And the book says to execute vengeance upon all that oppress. This is your season. This is the time that anything trying to come against you and stop you from reaching your destiny, stop you from fulfilling your purpose, been harassing you and your family is going to have to pay. 